Now, if you hadn't already noticed, this week has been all about the Permian. So today we're looking at Dometrodon, the kind of life it lived, and why when you call it a dinosaur, I get very angry. Now the Permian period was an interesting one since Pangaea had not long formed, arid deserts covered most of the land, and for the first time in history, vertebrates completely dominated the land. Now the way that they did this was by making some changes in how they maintain moisture. Amphibians who hit their peak during the Carboniferous depend on constant close proximity to water to keep their bodies hydrated and need to lay their eggs in a large enough body of water. But by evolving waxy plates of keratin that retain moisture better and by forming a hard shell that contains the amniotic fluid without being kept in water, they could go out exploring. Now forming this hard shell is actually what gave them their namesake, amniotes. By the start of the period, these new reptiles had managed to outcompete all other terrestrial animals and split into two groups. But I'll get into that in a minute. First, let's take a look at the Permian's poster boy. Dimetrodon is a genus of Salbach synapsid with a very convoluted history in terms of discovery. The first specimen was actually found all the way back in 1845, but until 2015, it was thought that this was the mandible of a dinosaur. The species actually described was by Edward Drinker Cope in 1878 when he named Dimetrodon rectiformis, Dimetrodon incisivus, and Dimetrodon gigas. Now it's well known that despite his vast contributions to the science, this guy was kind of trigger happy when it came to naming species due to his dick measuring competition with Ophniel Charles Marsh. Since then, many specimens have been reclassified or declassified and at the moment there is up to 20 species kind of in circulation. The species within the genus of Dimetrodon ranged quite a lot in size, from the size of a large rat to the size of a panther. Despite the size range, all species shared certain iconic features, being quadrupedal with the notched carnivorous jaws and of course the sail along the back. As the actual function of the sail, Many theories have floated around from helping with lateral movement to acting like an actual sail and catching the wind during aquatic locomotion. What does appear to have been settled on though was the suggestion made by Alfred Romer and Lewin Ivor Price in 1940 when they suggested that it served as a form of thermoregulation. When Dimetrodon got too hot, blood could rush into the sail and dissipate all of that heat that it was carrying. But if the animal needed warming up, then that sail could catch some rays and transport heat to the rest of the body. Now this theory is further supported by the fact that the sails seem to get bigger in proportion to body mass, the larger the species is, since heat will take longer to travel around a larger body. Speaking of anatomy, Dometrodon has always been illustrated as very much a scaly, side leg waddling reptile but phylogenetics has actually painted a very different picture. Dimetrodon was a synapsid, meaning that it was an amniote with a single temporal fenestra in its skull. Now this might not seem all that significant, but there are no modern day reptiles with this feature. They all have either two or no temporal fenestras and fall under the group known as sauropsids. Sauropsids are the group that we colloquially call reptiles, including dinosaurs and by extension, birds. Synapsids, on the other hand, are distinctly different nowadays, mostly in the way that they swap the scales for the hair and, for the most part, gestate their young inside their bodies rather than in hard shell eggs. These are also known as mammals. So, as a synapsid, Dimetrodon was actually more closely related to us than any reptile that came after it. During the Permian, though, the differences weren't quite as cut and dry. Synapsids of this time have always been informally referred to as the mammal-like reptiles, but that nickname is being called into question. Now, Dimetrodon was a pelicosaur, which were a group of synapsids that were superficially 
more on the reptile end of the spectrum as opposed to the more mammalian therapsids, such as the Gorgonopsids. So whereas therapsids are more our direct ancestors, Dimetrodon was more of our great, 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 great. One million, zillion, jillion, dillion, cotillion times later. Great, great uncle. Now, given this, it's likely that Dimetrodon actually had more mammalian traits than we initially thought. Now, synapsids giving birth to live young isn't known at this point, but perhaps animals like Dimetrodon were developing endothermal properties, precursing warm bloodedness. Or maybe they repurposed some of those facial scales as sensory tools, precursing whiskers. It also seems likely that Dimetrodon didn't actually possess as many scales as we first thought, since close relatives have been found to have more elephant-like skin. Eventually, the Pelicosaurs as a whole was eventually outcompeted by the Therapsids come the Mid-Permian. So Dimetrodon was actually lucky enough to miss the apocalypse that ended the period. So that brings us very cleanly onto the world that Dimetrodon inhabited. Now I've already explained this in my Permian video, but at this time the world consisted of a single supercontinent known as Pangaea. Because of the nature of Pangaea, much of the land, especially the middle parts, were covered in dry, arid deserts. Because of this, we often see Dimetrodon depicted in deserts, but the reality is that not much life would have actually thrived in conditions like these. Instead, Dimetrodon inhabited what is known as a deltaic system. These are low-lying vegetated wetlands with intricate river deltas that braid out to sea. With one modern example being similar to Dimetrodon's environment being the tropical wetlands known as the Everglades in Florida. Covering these areas would have been a variety of ferns and swampy regions, teeming with insects and tiny vertebrates that the smaller species would have fed on, as well as larger synapsids and amphibians that would have satisfied the larger species of Dimetrodon, with them being the top predators of this web varying its food on land, on banks, and even in shallow water, with food varying from Edaphasosaurus to Xenocanthes. Basically, the only thing that this guy had to worry about was another Dimetrodon. Now, most Dimetrodon species have been found in what is now North America, but one species has actually been found in Germany. This makes perfect sense though, since these two areas were right next to each other during the Permian. So Dimetrodon inhabit the north, mid to west of Pangaea. So that's Dimetrodon. And remember, if you do call this a dinosaur, I cut your Jacobs off. But if you don't want to incur my wrath, then be sure to leave a like. And if you do like what this channel is trying to achieve, then consider subscribing and maybe even checking out the Patreon link that I will leave down below. But for now, I'll catch you guys next time.